Alright, making a response video to Ludite Returns, and I will probably just jump around. Get if I end. read Plato's Republic, what was broken that needed fixing? You see, this entire zero-sum mechanism of desire, as described by Menham, will not appeal to those on the other side of an inconsolable phenomenology. The other side of what? <laughs> the buffalo's ass? I don't know. Um, Experientially, it's just flatly false. Experientially, okay, again, so that's what philosophers are supposed to be doing here, is talking about what they're horny for, or what they desire, or what they appreciate, and uh, you know, what kind of painting is the best painting, or what kind of music is the best music. I mean, that's just bullshit, you know it. So, saying experientially doesn't mean anything. We experience good and bad sensations, that one we can agree on, I think. Um, why don't we deal with that as the equation? I think that's the only rational premise to be talking about this in any kind of context, right? That's the that's the fruit and nuts of this thing. Right. Um, and this is not how I would imagine even those self-reflective people experience their lives. You see. Well, again, experiencing your lives is part of what we're trying to dissect. That's part of philosophy, is understanding that we have a thing called a psychology. So, really, if that's not going to be the premise, if the premise of your notion or understanding of what philosophy is, is that we talk about what we feel, and not talk about feelings in terms of their psychological mechanisms of their creation, that we are motivated by a psychology, and uh, part, in my opinion, part of what a philosopher's job is doing here is to dissect that psychology and see what parts of it have merit and which ones do not. Um, to recognize that it does, in fact, contrive a notion of value in the world. Okay, And that notion of value has nothing to do with where the real value is, which is in the thing creating the notion of value. Do, 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 I say. Anyway. So, and this cannot be rendered into the third person mode of description. That's the nature of qualia. Well, I'm not even going to talk about qualia and the nature of qualia. So, philosophers are, it's taboo. They cannot go into the sacred ground of the ooey gooey feeling. No, I think they can. I think we can know that all our little ooey gooey feelings are caused by something. And we can find evolutionary roots for most all of them. And that's what we're discussing here, is do, the, do these reactions have real merit? But more importantly, the, the end reaction, which is the whip and the carrot that is motivating the mechanism, does the whip or the carrot have any legitimacy? Is there anywhere to force this animal to migrate to? Is there some reason why a uh, sentient being should be motivated by psychological carrots and sticks to propel itself into a future um, and sentence its kind to carrot and stickery? I don't think so. I will jump ahead a little. Discovered, if you will, the philosophy of antinatalism, but at best it will kind of strengthen that view of life for people already prone to cynicism or pessimism, what have you. Right, so now we're back to the argument again that, okay, yes, um, we're going to be penalized, essentially, for having experience with the dark side, so to speak. So it's like if you are... It's it's like someone complaining about something they have real experience with, some risk thing. Let's say there was a risk thing, just call it risk thing, and they have experience with risk thing, and that personal experience with risk thing has informed them. Where somebody else would say, well, I've never seen risk thing, I don't know anything about risk thing, unless you show me some statistics that risk thing is bad, I'm going to play around with it. So it's sort of like you could I could counter argue that they're, the more pervasive psychological phenomenon is one where we negate risk, where we pretend um, you know, that nothing's going to happen, that we're liberated to drive on the roads and no one's going to jump the lane and crash into us and fiery crash, burn, burn. 
or whatever the thing is, that we are more likely to negate risk, to avoid contemplating or considering risk, than we are to acknowledge risk. And the same could be said in economics or in all these other things that we negate the price, the real price being paid for things, and pretend it's a lot cheaper or that there is a free lunch. But um, it's just really stupid. Yeah, well, I think it's really stupid to, to play this pessimist-optimist game. Um, yes, definitely psychologies are informed by their personal experience. If you know, if you go to the amusement park and you're riding the roller coaster and you go, yay, 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 fun, 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 you have an orgasm even, um, yeah, roller coaster's really cool. You go on the roller coaster and you throw up, well, then you might say, hey, roller coasters kind of suck. Um, so, yeah, those personal experiences are going to bias to people to some extent. There's just no way to avoid that. Um, but you're just insulting our, our intelligence, all of our intelligences. If you're going to say none of us can understand that, yes, some people have a good time, some people have a bad time, all right? I mean, if you're going to argue that I can't see that anybody has a good time on the roller coaster, well, then I can just counter-argue that you're not seeing the, the harm, right? So we just get into an argument about what we're not seeing instead of an argument about, well, if you add up roller coastery, uh, what does it add up to? I mean, shouldn't the philosophy stuff just get to the talking about what is roller coastery and let's concede the fact that um, what's part of this game is this, um, well, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, I can't concede your point because you're going to keep arguing that chasing these contrived perceptual carrots, these contrived senses of value I need, that somehow chasing I need is intrinsically productive. And I'm going to argue that it's not intrinsically productive. So we're already in trouble because, yeah, I'm going to say that people having a good time on the roller coaster First off, don't aren't recognizing the price of the people not having a good time, um, but they're only doing so because they need something to stimulate them, or they need they have some other pre-acquired deprivation of stimulation that compels them. You know, maybe they're just playing hero games. And as Dana Garrett pointed out in one of the comments. Um, you know, that ethicists engage in the very psych psychologizing, if you will, that they deplore by those who aren't ethicists. Um, well, I'm just saying you have to kind of prove that, but whatever. I, I, again, I, I'm going to say whatever your point, whatever finger you're pointing of accusation, I'm saying you've got whole whole hand of it. Over it. you got your whole handprint on it. You know, if we have a fingerprint of it, you have a handprint of it. Um, yeah, game over, right? Um, so let's go back and listen to what logic will or empirically verifiable to be meaningful. Hence, get me throw metaphysics out the door. Of course, applied to itself. Um, yeah, game over, right? Um, so the uh, yeah the asymmetry is uh, you know. You take what's an impersonal good, that is, the non non-existence of suffering, for a... Yeah, well, of course we're talking about non-personal goods. We're talking about overall and net equations. So I don't see any real point in talking about some individual circumstance, because that isn't what we're talking about. Not non-exister, right? So this is an impersonal good. That is, it's not good for any existing person to experience it. And you take a not bad, so you have an impersonal good and a not bad in non-existence, and good and bad in life. It doesn't follow that life can cannot be better uh, than non-existence, and this is okay. So again, so that's your claim. It doesn't follow that existing can be better than non-existence. Well, I'm just saying I don't think you can make a rational argument for the better because I don't think, okay, you can claim to create a, a satisfaction without first creating a need to derive the satisfaction from, through, a mechanism of need through which the satisfaction is attained. I don't think anybody, you know, like, again, we go back to this taste thing, okay? I mean, I, I am completely incapable of seeing any value in rap music, any at all. I mean, it's, 
are graffiti. I see no value. I see no art. I see no beauty. I see no nothing. All right? It's ugly. It stinks. It's nothing to me. It's zero to me. So how could, if I, I was propelled into this world where we are contriving this it is better thing, how the hell can it possibly be better if I can taste no value in it? That my senses can derive no value out of it. So I, I just think that's a bogus argument. You're not going to be able, these are distinctly different things. Being alive and being dead are different things. And you can only compare them in terms of their qualitative state, in terms of what they need. If you're going to go with anything else, you're going to be talking about something that doesn't exist. All they can do is need something. They can't do anything else. It's plainly evident. Mm. Christmas Day, by the way, yeah. The uh, ex-wife and the kids today. I did my Christmas with the kids yesterday. Mm. Anyway, um... <clears throat> oh, how wonderfully dysfunctional. Mm. Charming. All right, we'll jump ahead so much that we would uh, render the world non-existent relative to, of course, sentience, if you will. And, I mean, who's buying that? Right, right so that's a rational argument. Who, who's buying that? <laughs> so I can just make the argument, like, who's buying the argument that, uh, yeah, you wouldn't sacrifice all your good times in life if one of your kids had cancer and you could buy them immunity to the suffering? that you wouldn't sacrifice the substance of the good times and go for the bread and water. Yeah, just give me the neutral forever if I could spare my kid that suffering. So maybe you would. Maybe you'd be a selfish cunt, but I really, I don't even think you would. So yeah, I can just, so I'll just use that one example, that one thing. Who's buying that? That you would. You'd be that selfish and be that much of a cunt father. Who's buying that? I'm not buying it. I don't even like you, and I'm not buying it. Jumping ahead. Slave morality. That is, it's a form of revenge against the strong. Yeah, whatever. So you consider yourself the strong. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just a joke. It has nothing to do with being strong. You don't sit there and... I mean, if somebody's sitting in the corner somewhere eating their own shit and banging their head against the wall, you don't sit there and say, Oh, what a strong vital human being. No, you say, what a fucking idiot. Uh, you know, so this is, again, this, you know, this, this, this idea that, um, you know, you want to get into some sort of, you're just going right back to the DNA molecule. You're going right back to the, this is the model of what a performer is, okay? And a performer just takes it up the ass as many times as possible, okay? And just stoically accepts that. And that's, the, that's called performance because what endures over time. That's the only standard. And I would argue that, no, as, as, as now intelligent human beings, we can define better standards for performance. I mean, it's like the difference between saying, as a rational human being, I see no point in having an Olympic contest to see who can throw a fucking spear the furthest. The idea of having an Olympic contest to see who can split an atom the fastest might make some fucking sense. But this stupidity awards for being a stupid, bizarre, physique human... Is that strength? Is that power? Is that glory? No, I think that's crap. Whereas the non-existence of God leads the strong to create the beautiful in Nietzsche's mind, um, it leads the weak... No, oh, whatever. Yeah, the strong uh, to create the beautiful. What a pile of crap. Again, just... Just sit there and sit, yeah, give yourselves badges. That's all you're doing. You're just sitting here giving yourself badges for being assholes, essentially. Oh, how selfish can you be? Like, why, don't you have a, why don't you have an Ayn Rand selfishness contest and see who can be the selfish cunt of the year? And then you can give them an award and, and they can praise you for trying to be a selfish cunt. Fuck you. Uh, I'd rather be an intelligence than an asshole by, by, you know, you're just saying this is the, this is the nature of life. You're, and, and so you basically flush the most, the only thing about us that has any real integrity and you're flushing it down the toilet to grab hold of anus.
and preserve it. Make it take take a bunch of bunch and take a beautiful anus and put that on your wall. Beauty. The beauty of the power anus. The anus that ate New York. Because that's the only standard. How much can the anus eat? Yeah, let's give it an award. It ate a whole lot of stuff. So yeah, let's give it a trophy. No, I don't think that's the definition of success. <laughs> I mean really. Success is being intolerant. Success is the having the courage to say no. That's success. They could give consent or to decline. Right? So I myself, if life is in a move it, move it up here. wreck, and of course, in the case of a non-existor, what would the will uh, of said entity be if they could? give consent or to decline, right? So I myself, if life is an imposition, it is glad that, or I am glad that it is one that was so imposed. Well, whatever, right. So this is, but this is a stupid way to do it, right? You, know, you, you can't sit there and say you're glad because you're going to live your life. We're talking about a new life, okay? We're talking about the thing starts over, okay? So we're talking about going back to the original odds, Okay, and so now everything's back in the equation again. Dying at six years old of cancer is back in the equation. Being the elephant man is back in the equation. L-A-L-A-L-A-S is back in the equation. Having something tear a brain tumor and you don't get to go to college and you end up being washing dishes for the rest of your life, that's back in the equation again. So to say that you would still want to live your life, even though your life would be a completely different life, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? I mean, that's not the question you have to answer. Isn't like, yes, I'm glad to be a winner again. I'm glad to live in a civilized country again. I'm glad not to be an African or an Indonesian or a Bangladeshian or somebody who lived next to Fukushima. I'm very glad to be one of these people who didn't have their child washed out of their hands in the fucking tsunami. Oh, yeah, I'm very glad to do that. Well, that's not really the philosophical argument. It's not even close to the philosophical argument. That's just straw man. Um, that's a straw unicorn. <laughs> okay? That's not the subject. Dude, 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 I'm hitting the button. You can see I'm hitting it. I think most, the great majority of people are. So The great majority of people are. So again, we're going back to this. Are these people making philosophical um, um, statements? Are they making psychological statements? Are we asking a question that can be contextualized and rationally understood before it's answered? Or are you just asking some stupid question like, do you like you? Yeah, well, most people are going to say they like them. Okay. Are you a good person? Most people are going to say they're good people, even though they absolutely suck. And it can be demonstrated that they absolutely suck. You know, most people just lie compulsively. <laughs> so again, yeah, fail. Yeah, it was all your ex-wife's fault, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was, right? It was all her fault. <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes, this is where the F-less will enter their own brand of psychologizing. Well, you're just an addict, or what have you? Silly stuff. Right. So addiction isn't a primary. Um, in, it's not even. It's not even something you would even include in a discussion of human psychology. It's, it's just some bizarre abstraction. It has absolutely nothing to do with the two fundamental mechanisms of our psychology, hunger and horny, and the third one of ego, you know, the big motivator of I need to feel like I'm better than everybody else to some extent. Um, I don't want to be a power person. Keeping up with the Joneses, that's not addiction either. We can't even, it's not even close to an addictive psychology that keeps people buying more and more crap. No, that you wouldn't talk about the compulsive buying nature and commercialism and addiction. Those concepts have nothing to do with each other. I'm being sarcastic. I hope you all understand. I'm being fucking sarcastic because this is just silly. So you're smiling as you dismiss one of the most pervasive psychological phenomenons of our existence is our desire and compulsive desire. And yet you're denying it. Brilliant. Bravo. Fantastic. So philosophical. The problem with that line of reasoning is that if intelligence uh, 
um, is the product of evolution, right? Such that one... Well, the capacity to be intelligent is the product of evolution, right? Intelligence is another kind of idea. Intelligence is more like having knowledge and not being ignorant, right? Non-ignorance would be intelligence. So, um, you know, you, and intelligence is broken by misinformation. So obviously we have a vessel that can be intelligent, but obviously there's a lot of people who I think even you would admit are not intelligent because their intelligence has been corrupted by ignorance and misinformation. One can reason about the foundations of one existence, even unto the point of of destroying the very mechanism that was responsible for its creation. Well, again, that's totally irrelevant, right? We're not here to worry about nature's hurt feelings or the DNA molecules hurt feelings, are we? Are we really going to worry about that? The fact that we say it made a stupid cake, the, the cake sucks, the recipe suck, the cake sucks, the the, the concept sucks. It's a broken dishwasher. If we complain because it d doesn't wash fucking dishes, you, we're not allowed to do that because it's going to hurt the dishwasher's feelings. Then one can do the same thing um, relative to affirmation. Well, please right? go ahead. You cannot simply it. presuppose that one cannot, utilizing one's intelligence, come to the conclusion that life is worthy of affirmation. Well, again, I, I'd like to hear the intelligent argument defining what function life has for the universe. It accomplishes nothing. It stops no harm from taking place anywhere. We don't do anything. There, there is there is nothing for us. We don't even feed anything. There's no there's no there's no dog that need in the universe that needs to eat us and barf us up or anything. You know, it just doesn't need to happen. We don't provide a function, okay, as a collective. So anyway, yes, I was glad life was imposed upon me. What about those entities, let's say the anti-natalist or ethilist, who comes to the conclusion that no, I wouldn't have given consent and I would not want to be born. It's a bit ironic that the ethilist accuses the natalist, if you will, of selfishness. Well, it seems pretty obvious, right? If there's a risk and you impose it, that sounds kind of selfish to me. And so again, we're going back to this bias argument, but I could use a mouse trap as an example, right? One mouse could have gotten really hardly smacked by a mouse trap. I mean, it whapped him hard and good, and he knows what it is to be whapped. Now, the other mice, yeah, they've been lucky. They've snuck away with the cheese, and they go, ha, 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 I got it. Um, and they think it's really easy, and they don't really think there's much of a price to pay. If, oh, so what? It just snaps you a little. Big deal if that ever happens. I mean, I don't want it to happen, but oh, it's not going to be a big deal. So obviously the two mice have different perspectives because one of them has been there. So I mean, I can always argue. It can always be argued, I think. Um, because we do have to have some knowledge of what this thing is. You know, what, what is the character of this negative potential? Um, and do you really know what its character is? I mean, I could argue that at different stages in my life I had a different understanding of what it was. And that my understanding at 20 of what it was and my understanding at 30 of what it was were two different understandings. I was scared at 20. I was terrified at 30. Because at 30 I found out that pain can be twice as bad as I thought it could be. And maybe it can be four times as bad as I now think it can be. But what I do know is that I know it's not less than I think it is. It's not less than what I think it is now. The only place, the only room for error, the only room for error, this is probably a good argument, the only room for error is underestimating, not overestimating. Because you really don't have like unique personal experience that just where you are the only one really suffering. Everybody else is just having a go, it's just a breeze, it's nothing. There'd be no reason to conclude that you are that unique, that it's only you that's really feeling the hardness of it. So, that you should take into account. I think it's something that needs to be written down as, oh, this might cause some cognitive dissonance too. You know, that the only thing you can do is underestimate how bad suffering can be. You can't really overestimate it. Um. It accuses them of selfishness when 
<clears throat> what do they propose? That the world stop turning simply because they're not happy that they were born? That to me... Uh, yeah, well, again, I could turn that equation around, and if, if we decided, like, you know, we just make the machinery. So here's, here's the thing called life, and to have a million life forms that have a happy life, you have to torture 100 five-year-old girls named Susie. Okay, now it's your fucking decision. Here's a million people that don't need to exist. They're not sitting in some pen somewhere going, help me, help me, get, help me get out, okay? You're doing absolutely nothing. There's seven billion people on Earth. You're just going to add one million more of them to Earth, okay, that are going to be of your relative happy state. I'm happy, 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 happy guy. I think my life is super swell, even though I'm a drunk and a chain smoker. But no, let's ignore that. Um... And the price is going to be is that you personally, okay, are going to have to pick the little girls that you're going to impose this horror on. And they'll just, they'll live uh, a, a lifespan of just perpetual illness and suffering. You're going to press that button, shithead? You're going to tell me that you wouldn't just say, why would I do that? That doesn't sound like anything that needs to happen. Why would I do that? That would be stupid. expresses the height of selfishness, right? Well, this is what you always do, you people. You always laugh when it comes to the word suffering or selfishness or something, you know. And it's just so funny because, <laughs> yeah, let's just make it go away. And that's all you're doing. You're just, you're just, you're, you're, it's like laughing at an animal stuck in a glue trap, you know, because it's moving funny. Look how funny it's moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's that's a bullshit tactic, and it's um, it demonstrates just how unhumble you are in this conversation. Just how little respect you do have for the trap. Just how little respect you have for the risk. Just how much you have likely underestimated the suffering you're mocking. So, anyways, uh, at its most fundamental, the real reason I suppose I'm not an ethicist or an anti-natalist is, I think that the value equation is wrong. The ethicist says that a person or a sentient organism, if you will, is valuable because that entity can suffer. Right? Now, I think this is the... It's valuable because it's an experiencing machine. It's producing experiences. And those experiences have qualia. They create value. That's the argument. So don't, don't, I mean, it's, it, these are important paraphrases. And you have to concede you're not accurately paraphrasing. Exact, or it's exactly the opposite that is the case. It's not that an entity is valuable because they can suffer. It's rather that their suffering is value, valuable because the entity in question is valuable. Oh, well, please, that's just, you know, I mean, it's just silly. I have no value if I don't produce the, the mechanisms, the, the, the feelings, the emotions. So it's like if you have a machine and it produces nothing, consumes nothing, let's say, too, but it produces nothing, it consumes nothing. It's irrelevant. It has to produce something. You would judge somebody's behavior based on how it, that somebody would change other people's lives, either make their lives better in terms of how they feel or worse in terms of their, their sensitive impacts. You would not judge it if they were invisible and they did nothing. It would, it would have no intrinsic value then. It would have no value, okay? The only thing that makes us opaque in the value-relevant universe is the fact that we generate feelings in ourselves and in others. And the feelings in the others is just as meaningful as the feeling in ourselves. These things are equal commodities. We just happen to be one of the vessels as, and we're also one of the functionaries. 
But if you had a machine that didn't wasn't conscious, you would judge its impact based on how it affected the welfare of the things existing. Did it on net make the sentient beings feel better, or did it on net make the sentient beings feel less well? Did it cause more harm, or did it cause more comfort? Uh, you know, that's how you would judge it. So then, this is idiotic. You wouldn't judge it based on some other standard. Merely, uh, like, like, just because it created human beings? Let's say it just created human beings that had no feelings. <laughs> Why would we consider that valuable? Right? And we see that this fundamental schism, if you will, this rift, will be responsible for two entirely different system, uh, different systems of ethics, if you will. Well, yeah, if you will. Um, I, I just don't see how you could possibly say we have intrinsic value without the sensations we generate. That even if I'm a vegetable in a bed, I'm still alive, I'm still human, but I'm not doing anything cognitively. I'm not, I'm not creating a feeling, a sensation, how I could possibly be relevant in, in terms of anything that I'm intrinsically doing. If I was floating in the universe and no one knew I existed, would I exist as anything but a meteor? I, I wouldn't be a sentient being and therefore I wouldn't be anything a significant anything more than space dirt see what happens is with the former with the effortless conception of value is it kind of bastardizes the entity in question if we go turn to uh, martin buber's i thou right so uh, with him there are two fundamental kinds of relationships between conscious creatures and the world there's the I-it relationship in which the it is uh, not, an, it's deemed as an entity of value. In other words, it is only valuable insofar as it serves the purposes of utility. Well, and it can be cast aside. Yeah, that's right. And everything else is that in that category. But yeah, again, so you're going to just do this I, it, and I, them, or I, they, or I, something else. And so you're giving the I the double imperative. You're, you're doubling the I. Which is the bullshit here? The I is one. The, the the it, if it's conscious or sentient, is essentially the same as the I. They're the same thing. They shouldn't be given even different names. They should be called exactly the same thing. Quantum one, quantum two. There's there's they are the same functional machine. We are both this thing that produces this conscious experience, phenomenology, blah blah. All the things I'm doing, you're doing, shithead. All right, because we have different names, because we look different, because we even think different and feel different, does not change the value nature of our machinery. Um, so this is just bullshit. There is no I that or I those or I whatever. It's just bullshit. You are one quanta, they are another quanta. Period. Cast aside like trash, if you will, when you're finished up with it. And then there's the I thou, the, the thou, something that faces you, that demands something of you, an, an entity of value, you see, intrinsic to its nature. Like what, a tiger licking its chops? Uh, again, you know, you want to talk about these interrelationships and the, and the commerce between people, well, that's that's interesting subject, but it's not really antinatalism. I mean, antinatalism is dealing with the net, you know, not... Um, personal interactions between individuals. In personal interactions with individuals, there can be um, somebody can. Um, there's an economy to be had. Um, there can, there's a, 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 the individual can gain. The, the point I'm making again is is that there was no gain for humanity. Humanity didn't have a net gain when slavery existed. And it doesn't have a net gain, in my opinion, even under the current economics. Because for every happy rich fuck, okay, there's a bunch of one-armed Chinamen or squished in a coal mine Chinamen or some other kind of abused and maligned and destroyed Chinamen. Uh, and so there is no net gain for humanity, okay? There's net gain for, for individuals. Yes, n individuals can... Can, can can work their, they can throw other mice into the trap and get the cheese for free. But there is no free 
because the other mouse in the damn trap, okay, is the price. Now, so this puts the person, this system of ethics that I think speaks to my experience, puts the person before the suffering. Well, again, if you're going to put the person before their their conscious experience, and like I said, the other component of a person is their interaction with the rest of the sentient creatures in the world, the rest of the value entities that exist. So you can't, you're judging two things. You've got to recognize that there's two things in here. There's your personal comfort, and there's the effect you have on the other comfort devices. And it just it can't be seen any other way. You can't escape that there's those two levels for, on which you exist. And to say, I'm having a good life, doesn't mean much if your comfort level came at the price of you throwing a bunch of other humans into the trap. Whereas with the Ephelus, the suffering, and then the sentient creature. Now, and now of course, that this does not mean that where the suffering for that person is so great in that person's mind, in that person's, um, you know. Well, look, I could create a, a, a value circumstance where you might even concede, I'd rather not live that life, right? I could spell it out for you. This is going to be the life you're going to live, okay? You're going to battle cancer, and then you're going to go blind, and you're going to have a tumor, and you're going to have this, and you're going to have that, and you're not going to be a great artist, and you're not going to be a great poet, and you're not going to be a great anything. You're just going to be a great at suffering, really, for 75 years, let's say. Just a real miserable, I can spell it out for you, a really miserable, lousy, rotten existence. And, and you would, you, you, I think you could utter the words, well, yeah, I'll take a pass on that. No, thanks. I'm sitting nowhere with nothing. Yeah, I'd rather have the bag of nothing than that. Um, so I can describe a reality that you would say no thank you or no moss to. I think I can do that. I think you can see that you have some standards, that you wouldn't want to be a double slave or a triple slave, like a raped slave. You know, or a, you know I, could, I could create a scenario where, lives are, where human beings are you know, parasitically you know, controlled by an alien race and they're just used, grown for food and it's just miserable and horrible. And yet you'd say, yeah, it'd be better if humans didn't exist under those circumstances. If they have no hope to escape, then yes, it'd be better they didn't exist. So, so again, this is your, now we're just arguing standards. Not that, and so there, there is no intrinsic value to life. The value is contingent on the quality of the life. Having come to this conclusion, that life can no longer be affirmed as a positive value, then allowing the conditions by which this person can essentially exit stage left, if you will, trying to delimit said suffering, even unto um, euthanasia or suicide, voluntary, of course. Um, it's the person, if you will, the sentient entity that is being so served, right? Uh, the ethless conception of value, to me, kind of turns these entities into prostitutes, right? So, um... How do you know what that... I, I the suffering really, of creatures... I really don't even know what that means. Prostitutes? I, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what you're arguing here. Again, having people... Uh, again, again, I'll go back to this Frankenstein metaphor, but again, it doesn't solve the problem. It treats the symptoms. So when you, when, if somebody claims that it's not good enough to just keep treating symptoms, you have to cure this disease. You can't just keep creating messes and then obliging the mess to kill itself. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not allowed to force somebody into a bad place, um, uh, impose a certain amount of harm on them, and then say, well, here's a, a little spiky path I'll give you for a little more pain you can climb out. You know, what, why is it their obligation to climb out of the trap you threw them in? What, what are you sacrificing? What's your, what's your contribution um, uh, uh, since you are the one that did it? You throw them in there and you basically force them to climb out. Why, are, why isn't it your obligation to carry them out? Why isn't it your obligation to pay some price for throwing them in there? 
valuable because the creature, if you will, in question is valuable, not the other way around. And that is fundamentally why I'm not an Ephilist or an anti Yeah, so you're saying that there's some sort of intrinsic value in the creature itself that somehow has nothing to do with how it feels or experiences life. The quality of its life doesn't matter much. The what it experiences is as experiences isn't significant. No, it's just the fact that it's existing and and psychologically controlled by a um, four billion years of survival mechanics. That's all that matters. Well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that I'm sorry. That just is that that is way below the intelligent bar, in my opinion. You know the the the. the the reasonably elegant description of what's going on here. We have no devotion to DNA molecules um, ambitions, nor do we have any reason to glorify the hill that we're climbing, nor do we have any reason to glorify the things climbing the hill. The only thing you can... There's just nothing else here. There's nothing else here but experiences. And if you can't concede the point that the only thing of value is something that can experience, that can be put in a negative state of being, or a lesser state of being, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there is no premise for which, for us to do much else besides commonly breathe. And we might breathe in a similar manner, but yeah, everything else we're going to do is going to be completely different because your value system is negating the, the only thing I see as having any value. Anyway, enough said.